Good morning, Hebron. We're going to go back into the series on Acts. We're up to Acts chapter 19. Today we hope to go into Acts chapter uh, 20. Uh, and I will finish off with some thoughts on 19 and then go into 20 and 21. So as you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 19, 20, 21, uh, let me give you a little bit of an introduction. We've been studying the Acts of the Holy Spirit through Paul. And Paul is on his third missionary journey now, and he is in Ephesus. And we have studied the various things that took place in Ephesus. And uh, today we will specifically look at Paul's farewell to the elders of the church in Ephesus in Miletus. Okay? So for the uh, main scripture portion, just to read Uh, I will start with Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24. 22 to 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24. Again, just to remind you, this is Paul. After the riot that took place in Ephesus, he is now uh, left Ephesus. He has gone up to Macedonia, and he is traveling back, but he decides not to stop in Ephesus to cause other issues there, and he asked all the elders to come visit him about 40, 50 miles away in Miletus, and uh, this, is what is, uh, this is what he says. And now, compelled by the Holy Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life Worth nothing to me, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So here Paul uh, is giving his farewell address to the uh, church elders of the church in Ephesus. We can always see that When someone is saying goodbye or giving their farewell address, there is a great meaning behind it. They have given their life and important moments of their life for this cause, and he is reflecting on that in this portion. Just like the last words of famous people here, Paul is addressing something, uh, and he is talking about the legacy he is leaving behind. If you remember... When Paul, in the beginning of chapter 19, came to Ephesus, there were disciples who were not uh, baptized in the right name. And uh, when they were baptized in the right name, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So all of the members, all of the elders of this church in Ephesus were, under the, were started under the leadership of Paul. And now he's saying his parting message to them. He is uh, speaking and saying that, Uh, You ought to follow these things in your Christian walk. So this is the first thing, first couple of things to point out, that this is a a lesson that is given, a teaching of Paul to Christians and not to the unbelievers as he normally gives the sermons to. So he is asking the Christians, the elders, this particular message. And he is saying to them these words that we will go into. And... Also, this is the last recorded speech of sermon as a free, uh, of Paul as a free man. By this time, uh, the next few sermons, the next few messages he has, he will be a prisoner. And uh, we go on to see in the next few chapters of Acts his various messages while he was under bondage and as a prisoner. So there is added meaning and urgency to these parting words that he is telling us. So uh, he will... Uh, lay uh, the foundation, and the title of this message is, Are You Sold Out or Are You a Sellout? Are You Sold Out or Are You a Sellout? A subtitle could be, Is Your Life Dear to Yourself or Is It Disposable for Christ? As we look at the scriptures here in Acts chapter 19, I'll start with Demetrius, and that's the portion we left off with. We see Demetrius was a silversmith, and there was, other, there was a Jewish silversmith also by the name of Alexander. And uh, they noticed that because people all around Asia were becoming Christians, 
Their livelihood was affected. We see that people realized the true and living God, the real gospel, and all of the worship of Artemis in this temple, the goddess of fertility was going downhill and their business was going downhill. So we see uh, a group of people that are more interested in the bottom line. They are more interested in the money they could make and they are causing a scene. We see that there was a stadium full, 25,000 people that came and they took some of Paul's uh, disciples or travel companions and took them into this, uh, into this great stadium and started to scream at them and say, great is the God of Artemis. And Paul wanted to run in, but people had to hold him back. And uh, people that loved him had to hold him back because they knew that if he went in there, it might not be a good situation and he might not come out alive. So uh, we see certain groups of people at the end of chapter 19 that were up to no good. They're wanting their business to continue. They are more of the sellouts and we'll see them at the very end again. But we see someone who is sold out for the gospel. In Acts chapter 20, we see Paul, um, the, the portions we read, starting from verse 17 onwards, we see the message of Paul to the church in Ephesus as he is coming back around. He doesn't go into Ephesus, but he goes to a nearby island, Milet Miletus, and then he calls all the elders over, and he is saying all that will happen to him and what the Spirit is revealing to him. Again, in Acts chapter 21, we see that the prophets of uh, prophets of the land, including Agabus, uh, takes the belt of Paul, ties himself up, and says, Paul, this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. But Paul says, the Lord, uh, again, in Acts 21, verse 10 through 14, we read that portion. Let me read that. After that, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, coming over to us. He took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt, which is Paul, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When he heard this, we and the people uh, were there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. When Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am not only ready to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus when he could not be dissuaded, we got up and said, Lord's will be done. We see uh, a Paul here that is not holding his life dear, but he is willing to dispose of his life for the sake of Christ. He is saying that I will die for the cause of Christ. So Paul, why do you have such strong conviction? Paul, why, why are you um, saying all of these things? Why are you not selling out the gospel? You could have had an easy way out and said, Lord, I'm doing great work here in Ephesus. I've been teaching these guys for two to three years, and there's a lot of disciples, and he could have stayed behind there. But we note uh, various aspects of Paul's legacy in the portion that we read in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 22 uh, onwards is the portion that we read. He declared the whole truth of God. He lived a life that was constrained by the Holy Spirit. He was willing to endure hardship for Christ. And he cared for the flock and wanted to make sure that they would not be shattered or scattered after he left. And he believed that it was more blessed to give than to receive. We can see that in that particular portion. We might sum it up as the legacy of Paul Paul served others with humility and with boldness and wanted to make sure that even after he left, this church would continue his legacy. You might ask me, what does it mean to be sold out? So I looked up the diction uh, dictionary definition. It says someone who is completely committed, devoted, invested, and engaged for a cause. To have no reserves about the decision that you're making to be willing to go anywhere or do anything and to give up everything in order to achieve your goals by any means necessary. Isn't that the definition of Paul here? Apostle Paul was sold out for his missionary work. 
He sold out his life and he said, I do not hold my life dear, but I consider it dispensable for the sake of the gospel. So when as I was studying this portion, I uh, came up with some things that spelled out S-O-L-D, sold out for the gospel. And so verse 18 and 19 of chapter 20 goes on to show us how he had a servant mentality. That's the S. His life matched his preaching and his teaching. We see that he had humility and all of this because he understood he was a man that was full of pride and persecuting the church. And then on the road to Damascus, he had a life-altering experience. He should have been condemned for all of the wrong he was doing to the church. But the Lord's grace found him. And because of that, he had been changed as a true disciple of Christ. And his life matched his preaching. In a world where we see so many different teachings and preachings, prosperity theology, uh, many preachings that says that if you uh, name it and you can claim it, if you uh, do this, you will get all of these blessings. That is not what Paul taught. Paul taught uh, humility. And second, he had tears as a banner for him. He understood that suffering was a given as we were singing in this Malayalam song. He understood that there would be dangers, there would be sickness, there would be toils, there would be uh, times where his life would be in danger, but God would be the one to sustain him. He had complete confidence, his conscience or his uh, inner being had complete confidence in whom he believed. He knew that God would take care of him no matter what. God was a source of providence and God was with him and what his presence was with him in the midst of whatever he would go through. So though tears came in his life, he understood that God was with him. And he says uh, that it is better to give than to receive. That's a portion at the very end there. So the first uh, word, S, so Paul had a servant mentality. He had a true understanding of the gospel of Christ. He followed what Jesus did and he became a servant leader himself. And he uh, loved and mingled with the people that he uh, gave the gospel to. As we see in the very end of this, in chapter 20, when the uh, elders, uh, when they hear Paul saying, you will not see my face anymore twice, we see that they all were crying and hugging him and, and kissing him. So uh, he had the respect of the people and the tears uh, even though it came, he knew who his help came from. The O, he had an open heart that was communicating and held nothing back. He was spirit-led, and he taught from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the hall of Tyrannus. We know that in Ephesus, when he first got there, he tried to preach and teach in the synagogues. And when the people got angry, he found himself, uh, rented himself a hall of, the Ty of Tyrannus, and he was teaching. He was bivocational, but he was never compromising on the gospel. He uh, was someone that was not willing to compromise at all. And he, he wants to make sure that his uh, church that's left behind, and later when he writes to them uh, a few years later, and when he writes to all of his other um, disciples like Timoth uh, Timothy, he, he is making sure that they are standing firm in the gospel that they, there will be times when wolves will come, he says. He borrows from Jesus' term that says there will be wolves uh, in sheep's clothing. And he says there will be time when there will be false teachers that come up, even among your midst. And he wants to make sure that they ha are, are uh, steadfast on the word of God. You know, we live in a generation where if we talk about love uh, and loving others, then everyone is on board. But the moment we say certain things that are in the word of God, that are truths, that Jesus is the only way, then the world will be angry at us. And we will also be like Paul canceled. We will also be like Paul uh, ridiculed and hurt. And here Paul was willing to stand for the truth, which is the word of God. How can you have uh, love uh, as mentioned? If you take that out of context, and if you don't have the truth, uh, which is that the Lord Jesus is the only way to heaven, that he is the only Messiah, he is the only way. If you don't believe in that and you think everything is okay, then that is not the right gospel. And uh, when we preach the right gospel, there will be uh, 
rebellion against us, and there will be uh, riots against us. Uh, and also, we'll see uh, in verse 22 to 25 that life uh, for him was not something that he held dear. It was indispensable. He gave finishing his course priority over having a good ending. You know, uh, we always give a priority to having a good ending. You know, when I talk to folks, uh, people are afraid to die in the pandemic because they're like, oh, we won't have a good ending. Uh, but uh, that you won't get a proper funeral or something like that. Like, that is something that is to be held up. But no, for Paul, finishing a course uh, was much more important. He was not afraid to die, and he thought that his life was indispensable. Being faithful to the Word of God was more important to him than the crowds and the appearances that he had in front of people. We love to keep up with appearances, uh, but instead, here we see Paul that was sold out for the gospel. Two times he said, he would not see, you would not see me again, and he understood that uh, he was going towards Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, just like the Lord Jesus, that he would be uh, held as a captive, and that uh, even though he might have many more years ahead of him, that he would be someone that was held captive. So that was a life that was in, in, indispensable. He considered his life to be not dear, but indispensable, uh, that, that was uh, dispensable for the Lord, not indispensable. And then the D, he was dedicated to the doctrine of grace. We see that uh, as uh, he understood on the road to Damascus, the grace that was given to him, he was someone that was always, always teaching the doctrine of grace, which means that you don't add something on, you don't add something on to the gospel and the finished work of Jesus Christ. You don't add circumcision on or you don't add other things on. Um, like we tend to do, to say in order to be uh, with Christ, you don't not just need to do the, believe on the finished work, but we have to do this and that and all the different things. But he had such a wholesome and transparent life, such love and fellowship with the believers that he had brought to the Lord. You see that he despised his own life. And we see Paul was on fire for the Lord. When he was put in jail... He made sure that even though he escaped, that everyone uh, that came out with him, including the people that held him, were saved. When there was a stadium full of people coming up against him, he wanted to run into the fire. When he was in prison, he was not wasting his time and saying, woe is me, but he was writing the prison epistles. When he uh, knew full well that going to Jerusalem meant dying, when he had an easy way out, he continued in the path of his master, and he was ready to uh, die for Christ. If you go to 2 Timothy, as he's writing one of these epistles to his uh, uh, son, spiritual son, Timothy. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, we see for, in verse 6 onwards, For I am ready, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but also those who have longed for his appearing. So as Paul is teaching this to not unbelievers, but the elders in Ephesus, I believe this message is something that is applicable to us in the 21st century as well. Paul is saying that we need to keep the faith, we need to fight, uh, and uh, we need to keep the faith and be sold out for the gospel just as he was. And he says the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award, will be not only for me, but also for all who are living according to this uh, uh, lifestyle that he has left us. A lifestyle of being sold out for the gospel. If you go on to read, it talks about uh, Alexander, the metal worker. And this is the same Alexander that's mentioned in, in uh, Acts chapter 19. He says that, uh, he did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. We see someone who had sold out um, uh, there in Alexander. Alexander was a Jew and a metal worker, and he could have gone in and uh, calmed the crowd, but he, uh, his uh, voice was uh, not able to be taken by the crowd because they were so much in a frenzy. 
um, earlier, if he had talked to Demetrius, he could have possibly prevented all of this. Uh, but it was the Lord's will, and we see Alexander and Demetrius are people who sold out for money. So the question that we have in front of us, hopefully I've showed you that Paul was someone who counted the cost of being a disciple. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Amen. This is the words of Jesus. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, it says we have to despise many things. Uh, and pastor has spoken about that a few months ago. And again, in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, we see a portion that says in tw verse 24 and 25, John chapter 12, verse 24 and 25. Very truly, Jesus is saying, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while others who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus, just like Paul, had set an example, a life plan for us as the worship team is coming up. Jesus left this example for us. I know this is not an exciting message, but this is the truth. We need to be, let us examine ourselves. How is our life? Jesus left us that model of servant leadership, of having non-compromising gospel, a life that was not considered dear to himself, but willing to die for the cause of Christ, that was dedicated to the grace and the gospel of Christ. And we see many other examples like Stephen, and we see an example here with Paul. As I'm concluding, let me say, how is our life? Are we selling out the gospel, or are we sold out for the gospel of grace? It was George Whitfield who said, Let the name of Whitfield perish, but let the, let the name of Christ be glorified. Jim Elliott, who was speared to death in Ecuador, said, Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full life like yours, Lord Jesus. Amy Carmichael said, In light of what Jesus has done for me on the cross, how could I do anything that be counted as sacrifice. In Luke 17, that first portion, as Pastor has taught us before, when the master comes back, uh, when the servant comes back from the field and does anything, and, and we do anything for the master, we're only doing our duty. We cannot consider it sacrifice. So being sold out for the doctrine of grace is the least of our expectation if you're truly a true disciple of Christ. Apostle Paul considered his life disposable for Christ rather than dear to himself. So the question I have for you, the question I have for myself is, are we ready to be sold out for the sake of the gospel? Or are we daily selling out and not following the things of the Lord and living for ourselves and our own pleasure. That's easy to do in today's selfie, self-promoting Instagram culture. But where do we stand? As we go into a time of worship, let us examine ourselves. May God bless you all.